Hello, everybody, and welcome to Think You Know Wine. We are back again on Saturdays. My name is Renee Sperazza, and I'll be your host for this evening. And I am joined by the amazing critics from Wine Align. Wine Align is Canada's number one wine reviewing site. They review thousands of wines throughout the year and through many months. They have amazing cases and lots of great articles as well. And I have four of the critics joining us this evening. First joining us tonight is David Larson. Hi, David. How are you Hi, doing? Renee. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome from High Park, where the cherry blossoms are just about to do their thing. <laughs> and uh, we also have John Zavo joining us this evening. Hi, John. How are you doing this evening? Yes. Hi, Renee. Hi, everyone. You know, I got to say, I'm so grateful to have this distraction tonight after the, the day of news we've had. I mean, now we can focus on more first world problems like guessing the wrong grape and the wrong price for a bottle of wine. And I'm looking forward to that because, you know, we've all had too much, especially those of us here in Ontario. So thanks for joining us. And I hope you're <laughs> feeling the same way I am. Yeah, I hope we all feel the same way about that. And we also have Sarah Dalmato. Sarah, how are you doing this evening? Hi, cheers to everyone. Thanks for joining us. If you're local, I see some, I see a couple people coming in from Paris all the way too. So it sounds like we've got a great crowd and the biggest ever. Um, really pleased to be back here and uh, happy lockdown to everyone. <laughs> and we also have Michael Goodell. Michael, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks, Renee. Thanks for having me. Uh, I noticed on the chat someone else uh, saying hello with a last name very similar to you to yours, Sferazza. That is. Oh, yours. that might be my dad, called? actually. Uh -huh. That might be my actual father. Well, he I'm said glad he signed up this evening. Salute. Uh, I'm happy he's here. And also, I noticed someone from London, UK. So I think uh, we're branching out. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so excited to see everybody here from around the world. And thank you, critics, for joining us. Just a little bit of housekeeping for you guys. If you want to see all of our critics, just click up view right up at the top right hand corner. You can change it over to gallery view. This way you'll see everybody that's on the screen as they are guessing these wonderful vials of mystery, as we've been calling them. And our critics have the opportunity to score 10 points every single round. They can get three points for varietal two points for country, one for region, one for appellation, and two for vintage and one for price, plus or minus in a 30% range, 15% above and 15% below for the price. And they also get plus or minus a year for a vintage, but 10 points in total that they can earn. You'll see that there are some uh, polls coming up throughout the evening. There's a what's in your glass poll open at this moment. We're gonna also ask our critics what's in their glasses as well to kick off the evening. And to let everybody know that uh, if you have a question while we are going through our process this evening, please put it in the questions and answer box. And I will remind you guys every round, but it, please don't give away any of the wines for the critics. We have to make them work as hard as possible or else it's not as much fun. This is way more fun when we make them work as hard as they can. <laughs> so I want to go back over to David. David, what's in your glass tonight? Well, I'm feeling spring and pink. Um, and I'm actually quite a rosé fan, but this is not a wine. This is a cranberry apple cider. Uh, cranberry is, is one of my favorite fruit juices. It's the Pinot Noir fruit juices, actually. And, um, and I love eating apples. And I thought the two together, uh, it's a weekend. Uh, the cider is called No Boats on Sunday, uh, made here in Ontario, great name, and it's a delicious drink. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, John, what's in your glass this evening? I'm uh, revisiting a wine that we tasted a little while ago at the office. In fact, we tasted a few from this producer called Zuani from Northeastern Italy. It's a blend from Colio. So it's Friulano with some Chardonnay Sauvignon and Pinot Grigio. And I've been really impressed by this house. And you know, I have to say also, Renee, since uh, Michael pulled out that Colio wine in the Critics Coup, a couple of, I think you know, wines ago, I've been drinking nothing but Colio. So I never miss it again. <laughs> That's right. my mission. <laughs> No, you you will be prepared. That's very good. Uh, Sarah, what are you drinking this evening? What's in your glass? Well, I haven't been doing that kind of training, but uh, I'm tasting something from 
uh, from just around the corner here in uh, Niagara. Uh, this is Stratus's 2018 Semillon, which is um, a wine that came from the white case uh, of the exchange that we do at Wine Align. Um, and I got a few, had a few bottles of this and I was anxious to, to crack it open and see if it was as great as it was in the tasting room. And it's pretty exciting. It's a variety that actually we don't see a lot of in Niagara. Uh, it can be a bit tricky to grow. And uh, oftentimes you, know, you find it in Bordeaux as a, as a pairing or a partner for Sauvignon Blanc. But this is really nice. Um, it's a little bit aged and uh, it's quite rich and honey and mouth filling and uh, yeah, so it's lovely. Sounds like a delicious wine. And Michael, I have to know what you're drinking. What's in your glass this evening? You do have to know. So, you know, trying to decide what to what to taste before this, you know, huge exercise we launch into, you know, do you, do you warm up your palate with cider or champagne or white wine? I mean, what do you do? What do you do? But at the end of the day, you just open something you're really interested in opening. So I went after something relatively local, not Niagara local, but BC local, Rust Wine Company. This oh, is nice. the MA 2020. I know the group of us have had lots of opportunity to taste the, the uh, um, stable of Syrahs that, that they make at Rust Wine Company, but this is uh, the first Gamay I've had a chance to go after. And Ryan DeWitt is the winemaker. And if any, everybody remembers, Ryan used to be the assistant winemaker at Leaning Post uh, in Winona yeah. and Niagara. So that's, uh, this is one of Ryan's he, he took full over fully in 2019, so this is fully his wine, and uh, I like what I smell, I like what I taste. Awesome. awesome. All right, so we have most of the people in, in the audience this evening are drinking one of tonight's wines, and we are going to get started with everything. Just to let you guys know, we're going to get our critics to take out their bottles. Just a reminder to our audience, for anybody that's joined in a little bit later, please do not give away the wine in the chat. If you have any questions, please put them in the questions and answer box. Before we get started, just a bit, critics, I, we did have a question come in of who chooses the wines. I'm just going to answer that. It's the Wine Align team. So if you have any questions about that, please contact Wine Align. They would be happy to answer all of your questions. I know I get a lot of them from time to time, but I have no power. Please I want to pick them too, but it's it's not happening. So uh, we're going to get critics to put your first wine into the glass, and we're going to send you off to our critics lounge. There we go. Vials of mystery written on the front. I absolutely love it. <laughs> so our first wine for the evening, we are going to Italy, and it's the Umani Ronchi Centove Pecorino. It's the varietal is Pecorino. It's from Italy. It's from Abruzzo. The appellation is IGT. Colli Arputini, and the vintage is 2017. The price is $24.95, and we thank very much to our sponsor of this wine, Noble Estates. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there, and we are going to get into it, bring our critics back. For the first thoughts on this wine, I'm going to go to Michael. Michael, wow. what are your first thoughts on wine number one? Wow, you know what? My first thoughts are my first thought didn't last, meaning within 30 seconds or 45 seconds, the wine had completely changed on me. So at first I got this kind of flinty, smoky, smoldering, kind of almost barrel affected note, and then it completely changed. And then it went into kind of this green apple, slightly a little bit of terpene kind of, kind of effect. So I'm already confused, I'm already, really happy that you've chosen me first because that means that I get to pick, pick my what I think it is first but uh, that's as far as I've gotten so far. Fantastic I'm going to go over to Sarah. Sarah what are your first thoughts about wine number one? Well I think Michael's definitely got something there. Um, this is a wine that changed from my very initial uh, experience with it to now. I still think that it, it, it does have some wood uh, as a component to it, um, given the color of the wine. So it's pretty deeply colored and uh, it does have some bright acids to it. So uh, it, it could be a number of things. The oak isn't too powerful. It, uh, it seemed like it was initially, but then it, uh, it blew off and maybe there was also a little bit of a sulfur or something there at the beginning, um, but it still has this nice texture to it. Slippery, almost a little viscous, um, a little bit of that barrel aging, but it's, it's really nicely integrated. This is a curious wine. 
Thank you, Sarah, for your first thoughts on those wine. I'm going to go over to John. What are your first thoughts on wine number one? Well, I think it's a bright, pale, medium, strong, with slightly green tinted wine, medium plus, medium, medium plus viscosity, clean, moderate intensity, subtle. It's not an aromatic wine, more a white, yellow fleshed orchard fruit. It's also quite peppery, more white pepper than black pepper, also a Slight herbal green tinge, no obvious wood. I'm thinking old oak on this or large or large and small old wood. Medium plus body, medium, medium plus acids, medium plus alcohol, quite ripe, quite round, concentrated, uh, quite full bodied. So what is it? You have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> when in doubt, you know, default to just going through the matrix and tasting through and see if you can come to some logical conclusion. I'm liking the I'm liking the profile of the wine though. Come back to me in a moment. I promise I will. I actually have to. So I am going to go over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number one? Well, first thoughts, uh, gorgeous. Uh, I, I love the texture. Sarah mentioned the, that slipperiness. Uh, this this to me is a wine that's all about texture. Uh, it's rich, but there's good acidity. Uh, warm some warm alcohol, but not too hot. So it's it's big, but the balance is terrific on it. Uh, and I like John's use of the word subtle in terms of the, of the flavors. I think there's a lot going on in this wine uh, with fruits and herbs and spices, a touch of wood, uh, all beautifully integrated, but not, not one element is jumping out and it just comes together uh, really, really well. And um, a very difficult wine. We, it's gonna, have, gonna be fun to see where, everything, where everyone thinks this is. I am excited to see that. So I'm going to go right mm -hmm. back over to Michael. Michael, did you did you gain enough from everybody else? Are you ready to tell me what wine number one is? And also our poll should be coming down right now as well, just before Michael gives his answer. All right, fantastic. So Michael, what, what do you think that wine number one is? So I've jumped around. I've gone all over the world. I've actually jumped through grapes. I've jumped through a lot of hoops for this wine and uh, it better uh, pay me back a little bit for how hard I've worked with it. But uh, it ultimately, and it's this kind of vanilla caramel that kind of comes through at the end to me, and that's the wood speaking, that ultimately brings me, and the, that little green apple I mentioned at the beginning, it brings me all the way back to Chardonnay. That's, uh, that's I, I just can't escape it. I, I've, I've thought other things, but I can't escape that it. it just keeps bringing. So I'm, I'm going to call it Chardonnay, and I think it's Old World. I think it's Bourgogne. Uh, I think it's Macon. That's going to be as specific as I get. Uh, I think it's 2018, and I'm going to say middle 20s. I'll say 2695 so $27. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. We're going to go back over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number one? So yes, I, I also agree with Michael that this is Chardonnay and I was trying to get away from it, but it was the initial impression. And if I've learned anything from the accessions is to go with your gut. Um, I think it's from a slightly cooler, moderate to cool climate. And um, although it very well could be Burgundy as Michael mentioned or Bourgogne, the proper way we're supposed to say it now. Um, because the oak is so beautifully integrated in this wine, there are very few regions in the world that can consistently achieve that kind of oak integration. Yet I'm going to go on another path. I think the Chardonnay might be local. I think it might be from Niagara. And um, so Chardonnay, Niagara, uh, even though the color is suggesting it's older, I'm not quite sure this is a 2018 vintage because it was quite warm and I don't think it's as old as 2017. So I'm going to say 2019 Niagara Chardonnay price, uh, $25. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm going to go over to John next. John, what is wine number one? Initial conclusions, I thought of Chenin Blanc, but then I discarded that. I ended up with Gruner Vedliner and Pinot Gris as two options from the old world. I didn't think Chardonnay, I, I, I could be, probably am dead wrong, but it's that slight bitterness, un, not an unpleasant bitterness, that leads me to Pinot Gris or possibly Gruner, also the peppery quality. 
And in the end, I am in the old world. I'm in Austria. I am in the Danube Valley. I'm in the Kamptal, specifically with a Gruner Beltliner of pretty good quality. This is not just stainless steel. There's some, some wood aging here. And I'm going to peg this at about uh, $27.95. Did you say a vintage? Nope. Like 2019. To? Yeah, no, I'm with Sarah. I think this is a cooler area, but I think it's a warm vintage in a cool area. Okay, Just cool. Cover all the bases. Thank you. I, I, I don't know if I caught that or you said it, or but thank you for reminding me. And we're going to go over to David. David, what is wine number one? Well, you three guys were no help at all. <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> I'm, I'm still as confused. I, I actually have three different grapes in my mind. I pretty much settled on the country. Uh, none, none of my grapes are, are your grapes. Um, I don't think it's Chardonnay. I, I think there's a more exotic, um, uh, almost tropical note to this and, and herbals and, and lemon wax. It's a, a really interesting wine. So my three grapes that have entered my mind, one is Marsan, uh, another is Semillon, and another would be um, an, a, some kind of arom pretty aromatic variety from Italy. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to go Marsan because that was the first one that came to mind for me. Uh, it is barrel aged. Uh, so if it's Marsan, you know, or, or at least Marsan base, it's white Rhone, Southern Rhone or, or Northern Rhone. Uh, but there's something about this that uh, the acidity uh, that took me actually to Canada. Uh, so I'm going to say it's a Canadian wine and I'm going to go a Marsan from British Columbia. Uh, and I think it's 2018. And it's probably, if that's correct, I mean, if, if my guess is correct, it's probably fairly expensive. So probably about $45 and yeah, 2018. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Okay, let's, let's I, I feel like, like everyone's pretty ready to find out what wine number one is. And we've ever been further, further. Afield no, I, know. <laughs> I will say before I reveal the bottle, Sarah, you were the fan favorite for this round. So wine number one is the Umani Ronchi Centrove Pecorino. It's from Italy, it's from Abruzzo, it's from the IGT Colli Arbutini, and it's 2017. The price is $24.95. And I was wow, so rooting for you, David, when you said Italy that one time. Yeah. This went the wrong direction. Oh, sorry to tell oh, you look so shocked. Great wine. I got to say, David, as soon as you mentioned Italy, it sort of clicked. I said, ah, oh, it could be. I was thinking maybe something from Campania. Pecorino did not yeah. cross my mind, but uh, that makes sense. It's, it's quite a rich Pecorino, actually. It's a good mm -hmm. one. It it's is. We're going to bring and, up our scores for today. Get our scoring wizard to share their screen and see how you guys did. So we got some good <laughs> scores this round. <laughs> Michael's in the lead. You did a great job, Michael. Congratulations. And everybody nailed else it. is tied. Totally nailed it. <laughs> Amazing. I, I want to go over, um, John, I thought your call on Gruner was a really interesting way to go. Like, what made you think that over a Pecorino? Yeah, Pecorino was the obvious choice, but I, I didn't go that route. So, uh, <laughs> No, I mean, you know, we, we call them in, in the blind tasting game, these laterals, grapes that resemble one another. And for me, Pinot Gris and Gruner Wettliner with that bitterness certainly fall into the same family of flavor profiles, even though they're obviously different grapes. Pecorino, yes, I guess we could include in there. But for me, it was uh, it was really that slight herbal twinge and the, and the white pepper that I was speaking of. I think Michael mentioned the flintiness. I think it's a Lee's derived sort of sulfide flinty character that uh, you also find, you find in many different white wines, certainly Gruner and uh, evidently also Pecorino. But yeah, no, that, that's not a very well-known grape from not a very well-known place, at least not for white wines. But I think Pecorino is a grape that uh, should perhaps be on more people's radar because it is, I mean, it almost disappeared back in the 60s. It was kind of rescued from oblivion. And now quite a few producers make single bridal pecorinos of, of quite good quality and, and this is about as expensive as they get you know we're at the top quality level here but we're still 25 dollars. so in that uh in that view it's well worth a look it's really a, it's really a lovely wine i have to agree with you guys it's been uh lovely and uh what i wanted to ask next up on the list is uh, and, and any one of our critics can take this and it's can pecorino made like this age 
feel like Michael yeah. wants to take this. Yeah, you know, and it, well, you you read my mind because I was thinking something else which leads into that, which is over the Perfect. last four or five years traveling the world, I've come across a lot of white wines made in the Burgundian or the Bourgogne style, which means the élevage, the way that the wines are, are, are when the wines are brought into the wine, the way they're treated and the way they're aged, especially with barrels involved, mimics the, the Burgundian ideal. And so, you know, Alvarino in Northern Portugal, Pecorino in Italy, um, Chenin Blanc in many parts of the world, there's, there's, a, there's a, a sort of this Venn diagram of, of, of melding and merging of styles which makes it confusing to try to pick it out. A lot of wines are made in the Chardonnay from Burgundy style. So uh, yes, when you, when you use wood uh, and you treat it this way, you are adding structure to the wine for sure. And you're giving it, uh, you're giving it a fighting chance to, to, to last longer. Now, age, you know, the age of the vines and, um, and, and the quality of the winemaking and the quality of, of everything involved in the winery has a lot to do with it. So no, not just because Pecorino is, is aged in wood does it make it ageable, but uh, th in this particular case, yes, you could you could definitely let this go three, four, five, even six years maybe, and some interesting things would happen to this wine. Thank you, Michael. And Sarah, I want to ask you this question because you had said, uh, because you said Chardonnay. No, you didn't say Chardonnay. Sorry. Oh, I did. Uh, I did. You did. Yes, you did. Sorry about that. I got confused. I also read the word semillon. It kind of flubbed me up there for a hot minute. Um, are there similarities between Chardonnay and Pecorino? That's the question we have coming in from the audience. Uh, in certain ways, yes. Um, this is the thing. Chardonnay is a really good catch-all variety for, you know, that white that isn't quite aromatic, that you're not quite sure what it is. So um, Chardonnay is always a bit of a safe guess in, the, in that sense. But in terms of acidity, um, and Chardonnay can is such a chameleon of a grape. Um, and uh, depending on the conditions in which it's grown, it can be rich and ripe and tropical, or it can be steely and mineral. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a hard grape to compare to others in that way. Also because you can dress up Chardonnay in so many different ways or give it a complete undressing and make it kind of pure and fresh and, um, and sometimes indistinct because of that. But I think it's certainly in terms of acidity, you could make some comparisons there. And uh, this particular wine had such, you know, such brightness to it and um, it kind of a refreshing character, but it also had viscosity and Chardonnay often has viscosity, even if it's, you know, from Chablis, there is a little bit of texture there. Um, so, so yes. You know, you made me think about it a little bit differently. Yes, but maybe in terms of texture and acidity, you can, can make that comparison. I think that that's very fair with this, especially since there's oak aging on it. It definitely did show a lot more texture in the glass. And this is a wine that, that's nice and bright, especially when it's chilled. But I wanted to go over to David. David, we had a question come in, which is, oh, it's actually a two-parter question. So the first part of it is, is this wine name related to the cheese? And what would you pair with the Pecorino that we've had? Well, I'm not going to say pair it with Pecorino cheese. That would just be <laughs> too obvious. Um, no, I, I, I've actually forgotten the story of, of why the name is the same as the cheese. So if anyone else knows that, please jump in now. Um, Michael? Go ahead, John. Go ahead. John, John has it. I was John actually going to tell the little the cute anecdote of how the grape got its name. It yeah. is the favorite grape of the sheep in mm -hmm. Le Marque in Abruzzo. And in fact, it's the grape that the sheep would typically, because they were grazing out there in their promiscuous agriculture, it's the grape that the sheep would eat first. So it became known in Italian, sheep is pecora. So this is the pecorino, the favorite grape of, of the pecora. Maybe it, maybe it ripens earlier or something, or it gets sweeter, who knows. But mm -hmm. um, food, this is a quite rich wine. And I just want to go back to the oak aging for a minute on this one. Uh, we were at the office tasting just yesterday, actually, and there were two other Pecorinos, not, not this one. Uh, and um, I really enjoyed them, but they weren't as big and obvious as this one is. And so the oak here has really changed the nature of this grape for me. Uh, and it's due to the producer. I mean, Imani Ronke is a very good uh, producer based in Marque, uh, very modern. Uh, I visited there about 20 years ago when they all had you know, all kinds of new barrels and, and they're trying to make a very kind of new world style. And that's what took me to British Columbia actually was, was the, the, the oak treatment, which I, I never would have really guessed that this was an Italian wine because of that. Uh, food matches, I, I think it's really versatile. It's got lots of body. 
Uh, it's got richness. Uh, it's got really good acidity. I think it's going to be a fantastic food wine. Um, I'm, you know, in maybe into uh, re even risottos, so, you know, uh, vegetable risottos, that kind of thing. It doesn't Ooh, have that would to be, be a meat nice. dish, right? Um, but yeah, I think it'd be very food friendly. Amazing. All right. So we're going to get on to wine number two, everybody. Critics, if you could just show everybody your vials and pour them into your glasses. We're doing everything above board here, everyone. Fantastic. Great. We're going to get those poured in. And we're going to send our critics off to the critics lounge. Our next wine up for today is the McManus Family Vineyards Viognier. The great varietal is Viognier. The country is the United States of America. The region is California. It's from the Central Valley River Junction. And the price is uh, $20.95. The vintage is 2019. So I'm just going to stop this share here. We're going to bring our critics back in. And then you will see a poll that comes up on the screen right away once our critics are back into the room. Please vote on who you think is going to be winning this round. So we'll have that poll come up. And it'll be down in a little bit, guys. So vote away for who you think is going to win this round. We had Sarah as the fan favorite last time. Michael technically did win the previous round. So why don't we start with our fan favorite from last round and go over to Sarah for her first thoughts on wine number two. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Yes, it's certainly refreshing this wine. Um, it's got some pretty bracing acidity and uh, minerality to it. Um, it has a bit of this chalky texture, uh, which is quite nice. Um, it's, it's moderately aromatic. It's not leaping out at the glass unless my wine is really, really cold here. Um, if it's if there's any wood involved in its older wood here, um, it's uh, that as well doesn't seem to be that evident to me. Um, but there is some texture here too, and there is some ripeness on the back end um, that isn't quite obvious on the nose, but certainly uh, on the finish it really it picks up speed here. So this is going to be a tricky one indeed. We're, you know what? I think the wine line uh, team is, is playing is playing hardball this time mm -hmm. around. So we're going to go over to David. David, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Well, my first thought was it was actually quite similar to wine number one. <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's really quite rich. Um, lots of lots of viscosity. It's soft. It's, it's sort of cuddly and and warm. Um, as Sarah mentioned, not highly aromatic. Uh, took a little bit of time for the nose to come out for me and still working at it. Uh, but it's got this lovely sort of uh, it's tropical, I'm um, getting orange blossoms, star, uh, star fruit, uh, those kinds of interesting sort of warmer climate, more hotter climate uh, types of fruit. Um, pretty good acidity still for how rich it is. Uh, and and it's, it, the length is very, very good. Um, I really like it. And I, I think I know the grape, but boy, oh boy, it can be from a lot of different places. All right. Well, thank you, David. We're going to go over to Michael. Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? So it's funny. It, it, again, you know, that, like, like David said, it reminds me of wine number one. But for me, it reminds me of wine number one in that it changed so quickly for me. At first, I thought it was kind of thin. And by thin, I don't mean weak. I just mean I didn't get a, a ton of viscosity at first. But then I started to notice things like smells like rose water. It, uh, it's got a lot of orchard fruit on it. It, uh, it's got a little bit of finishing bitters to it. So it, it kind of developed. And then in the end, I, I noticed more richness and viscosity than I did at first. So um, another one of those wines where I had no idea in the beginning and then I really think I knew what it was. And then I had no idea in the end. Okay, well, good just luck. Just can help you out. And John's coming next. I just really wanted to yeah. help him. <laughs> yeah, you really, you really, I think you did him a solid. Um, John, what are your first thoughts on wine number two? Well, someone in the audience just commented that I look perturbed. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for making it obvious. Usually I have my cool poker face on. Like, I got this. I got this nailed. I know what this is. <laughs> wow, uh, nothing to give away on the color, but the smell is so familiar. That's why I'm scratching my head and I'm going to kick myself for not getting this wine right because... I feel I should know this wine. It's uh, the, the fruit is quite ripe. It's perplexing because it shouldn't be this ripe. And I say global warming be damned because you have messed 
everything up for this blind tasting game. As climates <laughs> warm, everything kind of converges on this really ripe style of wine, which could come from BC, could come from Northern France, could come from Australia. So it becomes uh, a tougher and tougher game with each passing year. But that said, I mean, there's a little lactic quality here. I get this lactic, almost bruised lemon, bruised fruit, orchard fruit note, and then it turns very quickly, quite ripe on the palate, riper than expected into this tropical zone that just took me for a flyer. No obvious wood here at all, maybe old, but it's not really part of the profile. And the palate's pretty um, pretty warm. You know, I, I put it down as medium plus alcohol, you know, 13 and a half percent, I would have to guess, if not a little bit more. And the final and the kicker and the most important thing is the concentration and length, I think are excellent on this wine. This is just hanging in there not for dear life, it's comfortably just kicking back in the lounge chair saying, I'm not going anywhere because this is a nice place to be. Uh, so did I, did I answer your question? Did, did I... Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good, that's a, yeah, you did a good job. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We're going to be taking down our poll now to see who the fan favorite is for this round. All right, and uh, we're just going to, I'm going to go right back over to Sarah. Sarah, what is wine number two? Okay, I can't escape this feeling that it might be Italian this time. I know we've just had another Italian white, but you know, as David said, there was something very familiar about this wine. Um, and where in Italy uh, was, was I, I, I wasn't quite sure. At first I thought maybe someplace like Friuli, but it's that tropical note that's really throwing me. Um, so, you know what, I think I'm going to go with, and very well might be off base on this, with Falangina from, um, from Campania. And um, in terms of the vintage, I think it's relatively recent, 2019. And the price on this, um, maybe $20. All right. And then we're going to go over to... David, David, what is wine number two? Okay, well, I, I said earlier, I thought I had the grape and I've been sipping away here and I'm not gonna change my mind on it. Um, it was my, my second impression and it's lasting. So I think it's a Viognier uh, as, as the variety. So Viognier is, is a hot climate grape. Um, so no surprise to, to sort of get the alcohol and, and the richness, but the question is where? And it's become an increasingly popular grape in, in a lot of regions. Uh, certainly the south of France is a possibility, Australia is a possibility, BC is a possibility, California is a possibility. Um, so given what jo you know, John mentioned, sort of the warmth and richness and texture, this does have more, a bit more alcohol and, and it's softer than I would expect from a Viognier from, from France. So I'm actually going to go to almost the hottest place I can think of, and that's California. Um, it's it's uh, got great length. Uh, it's... Um, uh, it's not it's not very old. I think it might have seen a little time in wood, uh, but not a lot. Uh, probably 2018, uh, and it's probably not very expensive either, despite that length of finish. Um, I'm going to go about uh, $22. $22. Okay, great, awesome. We are going to go over to Michael. Michael, what are what is wine number two? So I think David's spot on, and I could not shake. The, uh, the, the everything I described before, the, the rose water, a little bit tropical, not very tropical, but a little bit, the orchard fruit, it's warm, it's viscous. I couldn't shake Viognier either. So I really do think it's Viognier. Uh, I also think it's from California. Um, more specific than that, I don't think I can really say, I guess like, you know, is it central coast? Is it north coast? My guess is because it's not that rich. Well, it is. Uh, I'll say central, I will say central coast. That's as kind of as specific as I'll get. Um, I think it's around $20. I'll say $20. And I would think it's re relatively young. So I'll say 2019. Okay, great. And then we're going to go over to John. John, what is wine number two? I'm sorry, what are my choices again? I have. <laughs> oh, your choices are your imagination. <laughs> 
Woo! Well, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go somewhere else, just because it's fun to to go on your own sometimes. Um, aromatic. I agree with the whole flavor profile. I don't think it's Viognier. I don't think it's from California. I think it's a grape that reminds me of Viognier from time to time, but slightly turned down volume. Uh, so I ended up in northern Italy with a grape called Arnais, which is um, a an aromatic, semi-aromatic uh, variety with a little less volume than, than Viognier, but similar flavor profile, lots of tangerine, lots of uh, tropical fruit here. Warm vintage here again, global warming, as I said, messing us all up. And uh, I'd pay happily $25 for this 2019 Arnais from Piemonte, Lange or Roero appellation. Thank you very much, John. So I have to say, I'm going to reveal wine number two, but John, you were actually voted as the fan favorite for this round. And the wine for wine number two is the McManus family Viognier, oh. McManus family Vineyards Viognier 2019 from USA, from California, from the Central Valley River Junction, 2019 vintage, 2095 is the total price of this one. So David and Michael, you've done a great job this round. We're gonna bring up our scores right away. And Michael's in the lead, followed by David. You picked up a lot of points with that with that vintage, I think. I think it was just, the- Just wondering, should I have named a specific region in California? Because I didn't do that. Just he's curious not, for next time. a specific region wrong, but you can if you would like to, because he said central, you said coast, Michael. Yeah? Central coast. Yeah, yeah but I didn't say coast. anything other than California. So just for next yeah. time, if, do we, next do we time need if to say you, Yes, exactly. So next time, if you'd like to name it, yes, but you actually didn't get any, Michael didn't get any more points from you for that this round because he was wrong. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. But, that's fine. Just for okay. next time. <laughs> all right. So we'll take down our scores here. This was a nail biter of, uh, of a wine, especially from going from the Pecorino into the Viognier. We have lots of questions flooding in for people. And you know what? Let, let's start off with something, something easy. Let's go to John. John, you said the term length when you were trying this wine and you described it pretty intently. Can you, um, this also as a part from another question from before too, can you describe like what would be, what is the amount of time for like a short length or a long length? Like what determines that for you to consider its, its length uh, actually part of that, the quality of the wine? Yeah, and, and I said it before, I'll say it again. For me, length is a, is a critical part of the overall quality matrix, maybe one of the most important parts because that's, you can't fake that. It has to come from really quality farming and low yields and, and all the rest of it. And a little bit of sunshine certainly helps. And then uh, in terms of actual numbers, I mean, think of water, for example, which has no flavor or a, a soda pop that has maybe a couple of seconds of flavor that lingers on your palate and then it disappears or a really top quality wine that could still be in your mouth or I'd go even a step further, a, a great scotch or tequila or mezcal, something like that, that you're still smelling retro uh, nasally two or three minutes or four minutes or five minutes later. So those are kind of the extremes from almost no finish to you know a couple of minutes or more. And I was really impressed uh, with this wine. I know it's not that expensive, but I have to say this is probably, actually almost certainly the best wine from McManus I've ever had. Uh, I think they've got the variety spot on and it's true to type. They haven't overdone it. They haven't underdone it. So uh, kudos to that company and good value from California. Yeah, I think you're so right about that. And I'm going to go over to Sarah for this one. Sarah, you described this wine as chalky. And uh, can you can you just break down that characteristic note that you came up with, with for this wine? Like, what does that mean in the glass? Well, it's not a characteristic that I would associate with Viognier typically, uh, that's for sure, <laughs> which is perhaps one of the reasons that I had, uh, I had not gone that route. Um, but it, it is a textural element and it can be associated with a minerality, but um, almost as, as it's described, a chalkiness, you know, as if you were to, to put chalk on your tongue, that kind of characteristic. Um, and sometimes you get this too when wine is very, very cold. Uh, you, might, you might get this, this, this textural characteristic as well too. It could have been, it could have been what I was noticing. These wines were really cold. I didn't take them out until the end. Um, but still, I was impressed with the fact that 
this wine had such freshness. And usually when you have a wine with higher acid, you it is accompanied oftentimes by maybe minerality or a chalky texture. That being said, I mean, Falangina doesn't have a, a lot, a lot in common with Viognier, except for maybe that orange blossom uh, character on the nose, which you can often find sometimes a little bit of peach. Um, so aromatically, there's some, some similarities. Um, and, you know, there can be a little bit of, uh, of that rich texture that you often find in Viognier with that variety too. Um, but, you know, kudos to Michael and David for picking up on that. And this certainly is a good wine with nice structure and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gone there. So and speaking of Michael and David, I'm going to go to Michael next for this question, which is, Michael, can you tell us the difference between the character of the North Coast and the Central Coast in California when it comes to Viognier? That's a, that's a, that's a tough one to ask. The North Coast and Central Coast Appalachians are- I do not control are, the know, audience. The they audience, are, they, they are control enormous, us. These are enormous uh, you know, regions in California. So it, it, it would be very hard to, to, to give a very general answer. I'd have to give a general answer, but very hard to give a specific answer uh, to something like that. But, you know, the Central Coast is further south. Uh, you're talking about the area between essentially San Francisco and Los Angeles in the interior inland for the most part, uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Rita Hills, Santa Cruz Mountains, et cetera, et cetera. And North Coast is more Napa, Sonoma, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, look, there. They're all warm growing locations. We know we know that uh, there are obviously some very um, cool spots, especially where wind and fog are involved and create you know this major diurnal temperature fluctuation swing where you can have in Celsius 30, 35 degree days and you know 10 degrees, five degrees by night. But um, this McManus is interesting because McManus is one of those companies, relatively large company, but we associate most of their wines as being Sonoma wines but they're actually located in Clarksburg, which is its own ABA. They they get these grapes from uh, River Junction ABA, which is near the town of Mod the city of Modesto. And Modesto is kind of at the edge between Central and North Coast. It's almost due east of San Francisco and, and San Jose. And I'm not, to be honest with you, completely sure whether it's considered Central or North Coast, but it's right on the border, essentially. So that's probably why I, I wouldn't make a comment necessarily one way or the other. Uh, I find Central Coast wines generally warmer, richer, lusher, uh, less acidity, let's say. Again, that's a generalization that doesn't speak to all the wines. And in terms of Viognier, it applies to that, I would say. I think that's a great answer for this. And I think you've defined that really well. And I want to go over to David for, and you have a two-parter question, David. Another one. Um, <laughs> again, I'm sorry, but it just, works right. out, it just works out easier this way. How does this Viognier compare, a Californian Viognier, compare to a Condrieu? And what would you pair with it, this Viognier that we have in our glasses? Okay, so, so Condrieu is the, the classic uh, historic region for this grape. Uh, Viognier is the only grape that's allowed to be grown in the Condrieu Appalachian. It's one or two very steep hillsides in the Northern Rhone. Uh, tiny production, and Viognier was almost extinct, actually, uh, for, at one point, except for what was going on in, in, in Condrieu, but it's now had this, this global resurgence. Um, so, I mean, Condrieu has probably more minerality and just more, more elegance. I mean, it's so rare to find it. I'm not sure when he last had a Condrieu, but, but they're, they're rich. I mean, Viognier makes rich white wines. But in Condrieu, I find there's more floral on the nose and just sort of better acidity. And, and there's this, this lovely weave and wind uh, to, to the wines. This, this one is, is big, it's kind of blousy in, in comparison, uh, quite tropical. Uh, and um, again, loads of flavor. Uh, I actually saw someone asking what, you know, what is the marker for Viognier? For me, it's what I mentioned uh, off the top, sort of orange blossom on the nose, what I call star fruit. Uh, it's kind of a subtropical fruit, not, not quite pineapple, uh, a little bit more citrus. Uh, to me, that's a, a very definite marker. That's, that's what took me to Viognier on, on this wine was that one, that one element. Um, food pairing, well, almost like the, like the Pecorino last time. It's, um, but, but here, I think I'd be more inclined to go Asian. I mean, this, this is a big wine. It's got a lot of character. Uh, it will stand up to sort of spicy dishes uh, with, you know, with a lot of citrus in, the, in it. Um, yeah, so, so go fairly big on this. Maybe, maybe even curries and things as well. 
I might be ordering a Japanese curry for dinner tonight based on that recommendation. Yeah. It sounds like it'd be lovely with this wine. All right, we are going to get into wine number three, everybody. I am going to get our critics to open up their, yes, we have our vials of mystery, and we're going to get them to go over into the critics lounge. The last round, the wine of the evening is the Planeta Vittorio Frappato. It's 2018 is the vintage. The varietal is Frappato. It's from Italy. It's from Sicily. The appellation is Vittoria Frappato D.O.C. And it is $24.95. And thank you again to our sponsor, Noble Estates Wines and Spirits, for providing us with this wine this evening. All right. So we are going to bring our critics back into the room. So I'm just going to remind all of our critics to go off of mute and that you should be uh, telling me the varietal, country, region, appellation, vintage, and price. And with that, I'm going over to John. Hi, John. Hi, Renee. What do you think wow. of wine number three? I was just enjoying that moment in my mouth that you so rudely interrupted, but... Uh, oh, it's <laughs> almost like we're filming a show. Sorry. Ah, well, this is just, this is happiness for me. I mean, from the bright pale reddish with the slight garnet tinge on color to the moderate viscosity to the freshness, the clean, youthful bowl full of red berry fruit, light body, juicy acid, fine grain, sort of dusty tannins there, but not really there. Decent lingering finish. This is the sort of red wine I like to uh, put a slight chill on, you know, 20 minutes in the refrigerator, bring it down to 14, 15 degrees and, uh, and drink it with a smile. You know, there are only a couple of, of grapes. Well, no, that's not true. There are lots of grapes that give this a couple of major ones internationally, but um, I've got a direction here that may be uh, a little bit unusual because on the back end, now that I'm sitting here rambling on, I get this kind of really wild Mediterranean herbal scorched earth finish that I hadn't quite anticipated. That's why you got to hang on to the end. Don't, don't hurry to judge. Wait for it to finish in your mouth. All right, so I get to go first. Uh, I'm going to nope. take a few minutes here. Uh there you go. I think that uh, I thought you were going to say the wine for a second. It's like, no, don't let them. No, don't no, do no, that. no, 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 no. I, I need to hear. I need to hear what it is first before I can tell you what it is. <laughs> All right. We're going to go over to Michael next. Michael, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? So my first thought is, uh, like always, I knew exactly what it was the second I looked at it. I nosed it. I tasted it. The strawberry bit of rusticity to it. Uh, that kind of almost beat cola earthy. We all know what that would mean if I say those terms. Um, but again, uh, and I, I, I really love the three wines that were picked tonight. I know we're not at that point of saying things like that, but all three of them changed in my glass 30, 45 seconds in. And um, I really appreciate the complexity that we've been given in our glasses for, for this uh, particular Think You Know Wine. So um, I'm going to jump between that grape that everybody knows I'm thinking about and something that mimics it or can act like it somewhere else other somewhere else in the world okay i'll leave it at that okay great not cryptic at all i love it uh david over to you what are your first thoughts on wine number three uh first first thoughts uh, that's a very interesting wine it's got some layers and some complexity to it uh i i think it's a fairly traditional style which is kind of crossing me up a little bit on where it might be from um, but it's got this, you know, the, the color is pale. Uh, it's it's a, got a little maturity on it. It's not, uh, you know, ruby. It's got a little bit of garnet shade in it there. Um, it's got uh, lovely fruit. It's got some spice. It's got some earth on the nose, uh, almost forest floor, but it's a, it's a bit earthier than that. Um, good weight, good balance. Uh, it's it's not a, a modern, easy wine. Uh, I like Michael's term rustic. I, I, it's striking me that way, uh, but it's got a lot going on in it. And I think particularly with food, it would be um, a great choice. Amazing. All right, we're gonna go over to Sarah. Sarah, what are your first thoughts on wine number three? Well, my first thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go with because I was very excited when I first tasted this wine because this is a wine that I love and I, God, I, know, I, I love hope your, I'm right I love about your, it. I really <laughs> hope I'm right about it. Um, so this is a, a lighter bodied red with kind of supple tannins. And I, I'm pretty sure that it comes from a place that we would normally think of as very, very hot, but it's moderated by winds. And um, 
in some cases also um, altitude. And uh, there, there, there is something very distinctly Mediterranean about it, that's for sure. And I think um, it's subject to a, a good deal of sunshine as well. It's a great summer red. It's something that works really well with pizza. And I like John's comments about chilling this down slightly to, to enhance the kind of fruitiness and the freshness of it. I think that's great. And also I loved your entrance with just like the, the, the solid smile for a moment. I was like, this is gonna, this is gonna be a good, this is gonna be a good round. I, I feel it in my bones. It's gonna be a good round, everybody. All right, we're gonna take down our poll and see who our fan favorite is for this round. You guys have heard everybody's thoughts. All right, so we're gonna go right back over to John. John, what is wine number three? So uh, fans of <clears throat> Pinot Noir, lighter style, Nebbiolo, Gamay, this is your wine. It's not any of those three grapes, I don't think. Uh, I believe this is from Sicily. I believe this is predominantly a grape called Frappato. Uh, could be from an appellation called Cerasuolo di Vittoria, which would be blended with Nero d'Avola. But the color is, is so pale, which is very typical of Frappato, that it might just be pure Frappato on its own. And that's where I've left it. So vintage uh, youthful 2019 and price, I am at 25.90, no, sorry, 29.95. All righty, we're gonna go over to Michael. Michael, what is wine number three? Hey, Vero, way to go, Profe. Ah. I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I cannot shake it. I actually did think Nero Davila a, a little bit here and there, but again, John is right. The color is just, just not, it's not dark and purple enough for Nero to be involved. And it's too good a wine for it to be a weak version of Nero Davila, you know, to get this transparency. So uh, Frappato is correct. I, I, I believe it in my heart. Italy, Sicily, I, I think it's Vittoria DOC. Um, I think it's got, maybe got a little bit of age, not a ton, but I'm gonna say 2018 and I think it's $25. Amazing. And for everybody that is thinking why I went, ah, it's because Michael said Evero, which means he agrees with John. So that's, uh, that's, that's why I did that expression. I'm gonna go over to David. David, what do you, what is wine number three? Well, for the longest time I was, I was on the, the, the Pinot Noir track. It's got so much uh, similarity to Pinot Noir, but there was just something a little different. There was something a little bit too fruity, uh, in, in the end. Uh, and, um, and I, I really love the wine, so I'm I'm on board with Frappato. Um, there's some lovely uh, light-bodied uh, uh, white, sorry, red wines coming out from around the world now, Sinsos, etc. It's becoming a very popular style of uh, red wine. Uh, so Frappato, um, it's Sicily, uh, Italy, Sicily, uh, 2018, and I'm going to say about $32. Amazing. And since I, I must ask, did you want to say an appellation for this? Uh, specifically, no. <laughs> okay. That's, I don't want you to be angry at me, David. We're friends. You can't be angry at me. So I have to I'm ask you. Angry. There we go. We're going over to Sarah. Sarah, what, what is wine number three? Um, this, you know, right away, it was frappato to me. That's why I was so smiley, because I absolutely adore this wine. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if this is Planeta's frappato, because it tastes so much like it um, from Sicily. Um, and uh, it's in the mid 20s, um, $25, 2019. I think it's still pretty fresh. Um, and what else am I missing? Variety. Uh, Appalachian, if you would like to call it, you said. Yeah, I said Sicily. Um, I mean, like and, you want a, a more clear Appalachian. If you well, want. I think it's, yeah. I mean, if it's the Planeta, it's probably from yeah. Vittoria, right? Um, but I, I don't, don't I, ask me the question. Uh, yes. So anyway, uh, Frappato, Sicily, Italy, 2019, $25. All right, fantastic. All right, so Michael, you were voted as our fan favorite for this round. Let's get into what wine number three is. And it is most certainly 
the Planeta Vittoria Frappato 2018. It's from Sicily. It's from Vittoria Frappato DOC. It, the price is $24.95. So this is, you guys were really all on the same page for this one. I was, I couldn't get trying to contain my smile. Um, but uh, let's bring up our scores. Y'all built up some really great points in this for sure we have uh michael you are a fan favorite and uh you've won this round i'm not sure what we're looking at here right now scoring wizards if you could go back to whatever we were oh is that just the breakdown okay so michael has the breakdown from this round we have everything here michael's our winner for today congratulations to you and you've won the round but everybody really scored a lot of points there was just ever so slight differences between the vintage and the price and uh i I don't, also don't know if they gave you uh, Sarah an extra point for naming the producer right out the gate. So we'll take down this and I'll wait for our scoring wizards to get back to us. And apparently the, the audience agrees. But this was a, so we all really liked this wine, right everybody? Yeah, delicious, yeah. Fantastic wine. Fantastic. So good, so good. <laughs> it, it really is, it's, it's absolutely delightful. <laughs> so, it's delicious. <laughs> I want to, I want to go over to, uh, let's go over to Michael for this one. Since Michael, since you won the rap, uh, is Frappato a good, uh, Frappato is a bit of a, a, an obscure grape for people. What led you there right away? Oh, it, it has such a distinct profile. And Sarah, just so you know, Sarah got the producer. She deserves double points for, for, uh, for this round. Um, although I, you know, the, the winemaker, uh, Patricia Toth, who we all know very well, she's a very good friend of all of ours. We happen to, to have a, a real connection to this wine. So Frappato, Frappato. So it, it, it um, yeah, so we said, it mimics the Pinot Noir experience very much, but Sarah hit it right, uh, that, that nail on the head when she talked about the Mediterranean feel and this place that you would think is very, very hot, but Sicily is amazing. It has, it has a million microclimates. The winds come from everywhere. They come from Africa. They come from the Atlantic Ocean. They come from everywhere. And they come, they come from the east. So, you know, the, the, the island can be, you can be in one place in the island, it can be five degrees out and windy and raining. And you can cross over two valleys to another place and it'll be 25 degrees and sunny. So I'm like five kilometers away, 10 kilometers away. It's a remarkable place. And they've really figured out how to use Frappato, how to grow Frappato to make this beautiful, light, transparent, honest wine. Really doesn't need wood. If it gets wood, it's usually for, you know old wood. Um, but um, it's sneaky structured and um, it's just a, a brilliant grape. So it should not be obscure for people. Obviously, we don't get a ton of Frappato in, in Ontario. Not, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Michael. It looks like we have given Sarah and our scoring there wizards you to change your score. <laughs> Sarah, you are at 11 points. Congratulations <laughs> for winning the round. And now congratulations to Michael for winning the evening. So thank you very much, scoring wizards. The audience has, has commanded as such. But thank you, Michael. That was a really beautiful description. And I think right. that provided a lot of if really- you can find Frappato, you will enjoy just- just it's you'll enjoy it so much look for it do a google search find out ontario agents who may have have it of course we can help you out with that but uh, it's a wonderful wonderful grape yeah. and speaking of that i want to go over to john john um can you i, I know that this is a frappato is a volcanic grape it's grown usually on volcanic soils and i feel like asking you this question is a perfect thing to do uh so do you have any producers that you'd recommend or have any producers that show the historic profile of this grape varietal well, uh, it, it's not really volcanic. That part of Sicily where it grows around Vittoria is uh, is more limestone and mix. Really, Mount Etna is the only volcanic place on Sicily, strangely enough. But it mimics the style of Sicilian red uh, or Etna red wines, Nerello Mascalese, a little bit less less cut. But um, sorry, what was the what was the question again? <laughs> you had me at volcanic. I, I, I know, but like you you know that like. The whole island is anyway, but we're, we're not going to argue about volcanic things now. Um, anyway, what are there any producers that showcase the historic style of this of this grape in the glass that you would recommend? Oh yeah, I mean you'd have to uh, check out the wines of Cos C O S. They make uh, the blend Frappato Nero Davola under Cerasuolo di Vittoria label, uh, and also Pure Frappato. There's another producer we've been tasting a lot from lately called uh, Vino Lauria. 
uh, and they have been I've really enjoyed. We recommended recently one of their Pure Nero Davolas, uh, but they make also Frappato. And there is uh, Michele, help me out. Who's the woman whose uh, father runs Cos? Um, oh, uh, Adriana Ocapinti. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Adriana makes uh, terrific versions of Frappato. There's also uh, Gulfi, Tere di Gulfi makes great Cerasuolo and Frappato. They're, they're, they're a handful, you know. 15 years ago, this discussion would have been over before it started, but uh, today and now we're seeing more and more, mostly through private imports, some LCBO selections, but uh, the, the, the critical masses of good producers are there for sure. And just we've got another question. one, if I could just say, we've got another yeah. one, uh, Judeka, J-U-D-E-K-A. Um, we've, uh, the wine line office had the opportunity to taste a few of her wines, young wine, young, uh, women winemaker. She does remarkable stuff again, like Cerasuolo, she does Vittoria, she does, um, Frappato uh, di Vittoria and also really good wines and not expensive in the 20 to 25, maybe $28 range. That's really ideal. And, and the interesting thing about Frappato is that I don't know about if it doesn't grow anywhere else. It's only in Sicily, as far as I know, uh, unless any of the other critics would like to say otherwise. Nope. Okay, great. So we're going to move <laughs> on to the next question. Anywhere else yet, but uh, who knows? You know, it obviously performs well in warmish climates, uh, keeping acid. So perhaps we'll see it in other places. BC yeah. for Paco, David, can you see it? Yep. Yes. Yeah. The world by storm. There we go. <laughs> so I'm going to go over to Sarah for this one. Sarah, uh, what would you pair with this wine? I know everyone kind of was just happy with it all on its own, <laughs> which I agree with. But what would you pair it with? Well, here's the thing, like this is a great aperitivo one. You don't actually need to pair anything with it because it's nice and complete and refreshing on its own. Um, but, you know, as I, I mentioned, this is this is a pizza favorite. Right. And I wouldn't um, I wouldn't pair any food with it. That's too complicated. Um, you know, something simple. And this is the great thing about Italian food in general. It's that it's all about a few really good simple ingredients. And I think that this wine deserves something like that. Um, but, you know, we really not, don't overload it with anything spicy or charred or smoky. Um, you know, it's, it's lovely and refreshing. I think that you risk more by pairing it with food, taking away from this this particular wine um than uh than anything so yeah i say enjoy it as it is poolside slightly chilled or you know on your own in the kitchen when you while you're making dinner on a hot summer's day i love that thank you and david i have a question for you as well we had a question about the ageability of this wine what would you say the ageability of, of the wine that we're drinking tonight is well it's not a wine i would even consider really aging for to in, in, in any expectation that's going to be I'm sorry, better than is it that, is now. Is that because it's too good? You have to keep just drinking. Yeah, I, I, I you know, if I had a case of this, it would be done within a month. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and it is that style of wine. It's a drinking wine. Um, it it will keep probably. You know, if if you want to keep it, if, if you buy ten cases <laughs> at a time and you, and you want to drink it over a year or two. But um, no, it's it's not a highly structured wine. Um, you know, the acid, it doesn't have a lot of acid and tannins, so it's not in that traditional camp of, of an aging red. And I think that's its absolute beauty that, you know, you can, you can drink it as it is now. And I, for those of you who have got that wine out, out there, um, I've been going back to this and the nose is just really blooming now. It's getting very, very floral, all kinds of strawberry, cherry. It's, um, it's really a, a gorgeous nose. Um, and I agree with Sarah on the food matching. Keep it simple. I mean, uh, you know, don't don't have very spicy, uh, hot dishes with this. It's uh, you want something, you know, like maybe braised rabbit or something, and not too heavy a sauce. Or you know, think think what you would have with Pinot Noir, maybe, and mm -hmm. and bring this into into the game. And I see in the chat that some people are having difficulty finding this wine. I saw a lot of it at the Forty Nine Spadina LCBO literally yesterday. So if you go there, you will find it. I don't drive. And I can walk there, so I don't really know what other LCBOs it's at because I didn't see it with my own two eyes. Yeah, but this this I, this wine, by the way, was released on April the third, uh, and and it sold very very quickly at the LCBO. Did. Yeah, it's so really that's nice. that's probably why you can't find it. So use Wine Line, get on Wine Line site, and go find this bottle, and uh, hopefully you'll find one near you. Amazing. And we had one question come in that I've kind of been saving till the end because I actually think it's a really topical question that I think uh, I would like to hear from the critics, and it is to the global warming issue. 
are previously warm climates now compromised in their ability to produce classical styles? Are they pushed further in concentration, further in, uh, pushed in, sorry, pushed further in their concentrations to new styles, to new world styles? I thought it was a good question. So we've saved it, it till the end. Good. And I, I want every critic to, to, to say whatever they think on this one. And that's gonna be our last question for the night, everybody. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a, yeah. that's a big question. Maybe the, the biggest question in the world of wine right now. And, and the question was, you know, has it pushed classical wine styles from warm regions over the edge? Well, I say it's pushed every classical wine style in a new direction. So what was cool is now moderate. What was moderate is now warm. What was warm is in some cases uh, too warm for fine wine, or at least the varieties that were grown, or at least the traditional viticultural winemaking methods that have been applied. So the world of wine is, is changing rapidly. And I can tell you that every discussion I've had with a winemaker in the last year, at least, if not longer than that, has at some point touched upon that issue and how it has affected, is affecting wine styles. So uh, stay tuned because the world is, is, is turning quite quickly. And uh, go, go right ahead. It looks like Michael is going to say something next. Yeah, John is absolutely right. And also what it's done is if you, so if you take a classic region and I'll pick one out of the hat, like a Chianti Classico, for, for example, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not on, that's not on brand for you at farming, all. If you're farming at 200 or 250 meters above sea level, and obviously the climate has changed your work dra dramatically, where you're going to do most of your work to combat it is in the vineyard. It's not so much in how you make the wine, but what you do with your canopy management and how you, how you manage your vines. Um, but what it does is it also brings in elevations at 550, 600, 650 meters above sea level into the fray. All of a sudden, you're a producer who's had vineyards at that elevation and, you know, three or four out of four or four out of six years now, you're getting max, you're getting full ripeness out of your Sangiovese grapes. So um, that's really what we're seeing is that fringe wine, you know, fringe wine, and we're seeing it in Ontario, right? We're seeing much more ripeness in Niagara and in Prince Edward County uh, than we ever have. You can get much, much uh, riper grapes than, than you used to be able to. It's pretty yeah. intense. And uh, Sarah, David, whoever would like to go to Sarah. Sarah looks like you're up next. Well, you know, I com completely agree with my colleagues. Um, a couple a couple things to add. One is that not all regions are affected equally by global warming. So for example, if you have um, a, a moderating influence, like a large body of water um, or, or a lot of elevation altitude, John, which one is it that I'm not supposed to use? Elevation is the correct one, yes. Elevation, thank you. <laughs> that for the next time, you should you should explain that to everyone. But anyway, um, so elevation uh, that can help moderate those effects. But you know, if you're in a landlocked area, and if you're normally warm anyway, if you're in a warm region, you might be more affected by by it than other uh, regions. But also, global warming isn't just um, isn't just about heat. It does give these really really erratic kind of climatic, um, both temperature shift and weather patterns. And, and we see this all over the world. We see it in fringe growing regions like in Chablis and in Northern Burgundy, you know, with hailstorms and, and, uh, and, and spring frost that is different. Oregon also sees that, you know, that kind of um, changes in weather patterns. So it's not only about you know, getting warmer and warmer. It's also about these erratic uh, weather patterns and, you know, not everybody is affected equally. And oh. I think you're right. It's definitely about climate change. And David, do you have anything that you want to add to this? Yeah, just, just two quick examples of how it's affecting. I mean, France last year, I think, was just last year or in 2019, actually authorized a whole bunch of new grape varieties in regions where they were not authorized. They were before. testing them last year. They officially yeah. came out as approved this year, yeah. one of which yeah. is Liga so Nacional. Yeah, I'm not going to get into what, what they're planning where, but it's being recognized at a, at a very high level that this is a, a real thing. And at a very sort of microscopic level, level. One of the better Chardonnays I actually had from Ontario uh, in 2019 was from Carp Ridge in the Ottawa Valley. That's a little, little limestone ridge in the Ottawa Valley. And, and it was a really lovely wine. I'm going to have to give that one a try, but I want to thank critics. Thank you all. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you all so much for joining me again this evening. It, it's been a wonderful night and, and everybody in the audience seems to be on, uh, on clapping hands for this, but thank you all and cheers everybody for this evening. Thanks, Renee. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Cheers, okay, everyone. Good night. Thanks See you in a couple us. weeks. Good night. Cheers. Ah. See you guys next, next, next week. <laughs>